On a routine survey mission of Sol System Orion Spur, Teapot 14 Alpha 6 encountered two unidentified spacecraft orbiting a common center of mass one million miles from Orion M41 colon 3, Earth. Although the survey teapot had the tactical advantage, neutrino cannons were disengaged as both unidentified spacecraft were suspected to be of scientific purpose. Initiate Omnisensor Satellite Trace. Identifying Herschel Space Observatory, Planck Satellite, Origin, Orion M41 colon 3, Earth, Teapot 14 Alpha 6, authorized for emergency abduction. I'm currently standing in front of a scale model of the Planck Satellite. This is a a one to four scale model, so the actual thing is four times wider, four times taller. Well, the, uh, the satellite is about seven and a half meters high, and it's about four meters wide, and it weighs uh, approximately three and a half tons, so it's, it's quite big. Um, one of the biggest uh, um, sort of scientific satellites that ESA will have launched. When astronomers are making observations, they only go into space when it's absolutely necessary because uh, everything is much more expensive and much more difficult. And the reason we have to put Herschel in space is that we can't see this radiation from the ground. It's uh, absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. and uh, The Earth's atmosphere is also very bright itself at these wavelengths, so we would be completely swamped by uh, the radiation from, from the Earth's atmosphere, so we have to go into space. Now for Planck, we're looking at radiation from the start of the universe, essentially. We're looking at radiation from about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. This was a cosmological signal coming from uh, all over space, and it was completely uniform, and this became known as the cosmic microwave background. Cosmic because it's cosmic, microwave because it was at microwave frequencies, and background because it seemed to be behind everything else that they tried to look at. At about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe had been cooling and expanding, and it became uh, cool enough for atoms to form. And suddenly you didn't have uh, this plasma. This plasma is this ionized gas uh, of the electrons and the protons that, that were scattering the light. It's very, it was very similar to the surface of the sun, is, is a plasma, and you can't see through the surface of the sun. And suddenly the universe became transparent, and the, the light that had been flying around the universe and scattering off uh, all these electrons could then free stream, they could travel in straight lines, and we pick up that light today. When uh, the, uh, this black body, this, this cosmic microwave background was studied in more detail, it was discovered that there are slight ripples on it. We see a slight, uh, we see very tiny ripples at about one part in a hundred thousand. Now, saying one part in a hundred thousand is, can, can be a bit meaningless, but if you consider the Earth, and assume the Earth was smooth to one part in a hundred thousand, the tallest mountain would then be about ten centimetres tall, to be incredibly smooth. So these tiny, tiny fluctuations, which originated from uh, quantum fluctuations, the very birth of the universe, uh, have been imprinted on the cosmic microwave background. And they contain information about the formation of the universe, the evolution of the universe, the composition of the universe, uh, how much of the universe is dark matter, dark energy, and normal matter, if, uh, if, if these theories prove to be true. Well, as well as uh, looking for um, star forming, and that can be either in our own galaxy or in distant galaxies as they formed a long time ago, we can look at objects within our, old, our own solar system, you know, particularly the planets, um, their atmospheres, and also comets, uh, which radiate quite a lot in the infrared. And we can tell a lot more, in fact, about planet and cometary atmospheres from the infrared than we can from optical wavelengths. As Matt said, I mean, a lot of uh, astronomical sources um, radiate very strongly in the infrared. Um, things that you just can't see if you just look in the visible, you just completely miss. A lot of interesting stuff happens um, that's obscured by clouds of gas and dust in space. Uh, for instance, you might have stars forming uh, within a big cloud of gas and dust, and you can't see through that. But what you can see is the thermal emission, the infrared light, that is caused by those stars warming up that cloud that's in front. A common analogy is that um, doing astronomy at these wavelengths is much like a visible astronomer trying to observe the stars on a cloudy day. So a lot of satellites that are launched from Earth to do astronomy sit in what they call low Earth orbit, certainly Earth orbit, and they orbit the Earth and they orbit typically once every 90 minutes. And this has uh, some serious side effects. One is that you're constantly going uh, between huge temperature shifts uh, between dark uh, day and night and your temperature of your satellite will increase and decrease radically. And that for Planck trying to stabilise its, its internal temperatures to this tiny, tiny accuracy it would be disastrous. 
And the other problem is that the Earth itself is so close and so warm, it's, it's kicking out a huge amount of, uh, of radiation in, in these wave bands just due to the fact that the Earth is about room temperature. You know, it's about 20 something degrees, so it's about 300 Kelvin, which compared to 0.1 Kelvin is huge. And it also blocks out half the sky because it's, it's filled with a you know, the huge field of view. But it goes to a point in space which is well, n known as the second Lagrange point, so one and a half million kilometers away from the Earth. It's, um, it, to actually get there physically, um, you have to approach it in a very special way. It takes roughly six months, is it right, to, to get to that orbital point. Um, it's a significant distance away from the Earth and it always orbits such that the Earth is always between the satellite and the Sun. So it takes one year to orbit the Sun in one go. Unlike the Hubble, which orbits the Earth, Herschel orbits the Sun with the Earth. Um, <clears throat> the reason for that is that you want to be quite a significant distance away from the Earth itself. Um, because the Earth itself is glowing like a red, you know, a very bright light. The Earth is like a sun in the visible, essentially. Um, at these wavelengths, the Earth is a, a glows very brightly, so you want to be a long way from the radiation of the Earth itself. We should point out that no astronomers were harmed in this teapot abduction. No. The remains of some dead stars, like supernova remnants, can be observed from Earth, but you will rarely be able to see the whole picture with an optical telescope. Herschel and Planck, like night vision goggles or thermal imaging cameras, can see into the cold darkness of space. These space telescopes can scan the sky at infrared and microwave wavelengths much longer than the human eye can see, allowing them to spy out the faint traces of heat that dark bodies imprint on the sky.